Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. I'm Mark Cohen of the Government Accountability Project. Later in this show, conversations with a leading whistleblower and a new breed investigative reporter, both of the Czech Republic. But first, a little background on this emerging democracy, only 22 years removed from suffering, first under the Nazis and then Soviet repression. Czechs learned the hard way to keep their lips sealed and to not question authority. <clears throat> But since the 1989 revolution, the veil of fear has slowly lifted and Czechs are starting to push their institutions for greater accountability. The operative phrase here is starting to push. Say, B. Edwards and Dylan Blaylock, my colleagues at the Government Accountability Project and recent visitors to the Czech Republic, welcome to Whistle Where You Work. B. let's start with you. Uh, you and Dylan both went to Prague in January for a conference uh, that was, well, tell me about it. What was its purpose? Well, it was almost two years in the making, although it was only one year that GAP was involved. But in 2009, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe passed or decided to um, promote whistleblowing as an anti-corruption tool in the European Union. And uh, in 2010, the Assembly passed a resolution that asked the Council of European Ministers to do three things. One was to develop guidelines for whistleblower legislation and whistleblower protection. And the second thing was to compare then their national legislation and regulations to the guidelines. And then the third thing was to consider developing a framework convention for whistleblowing as an anti-corruption measure. So we were working along with NGOs, particularly Transparency International and Open Society Institute, as this process progressed. And uh, we met then with OSF, Open Society Fund in Prague, in September to talk about a special conference of non-governmental organizations who worked on anti-corruption issues and investigative journalists uh, to bring everyone together with NGOs and some journalists from the United States and the UK uh, to consider how we might all work together to realize the goals of the of the Assembly's resolution. And so this meeting in January occurred at a kind of propitious moment, right, in the changing of the guard at the U.S. Embassy. What was that? We were very lucky because um, in December uh, 2010, Norman Eisen, who had been the ethics counsel for the White House, was appointed, uh, uh, was appointed uh, by President Obama as the as the ambassador to the Czech Republic. And he arrived in Prague the same week that Dylan and I did for the, for the workshop. And he was very, very supportive. And he's always been a good friend of GAP and a supportive uh, uh, official for anti-corruption measures and especially for whistleblowing and had worked very hard on the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act in the United States. So we were very lucky to have him there and at the same time, there was just breaking a very high visibility uh, whistleblower case with the retaliation against the whistleblower uh, widely uh, uh, disseminated in the press. So the issue was very prominent really for the first time in Prague and the Czech Republic generally in January 2011, just as we started working. Okay, so tell me some of the highlights of that conference. Well, the conference uh, was two days, and we worked very closely with the embassy, the U.S. Embassy and uh, OSF co-sponsored. And there were NGOs and investigative journalists from uh, Prague, the Czech Republic, uh, to work with us. The, the idea or the, I guess the, the dilemma we all face going into it is everyone recognized that there is something of a negative uh, context surrounding the idea of a whistleblower in Central and Eastern Europe, and in Europe generally, and, and to some extent in the United States still. Um, but the Czech Republic, um, as you mentioned earlier, is coming out of a long history of repressive government, and there is an even more um, kind of 
a stronger prohibition on, on whistleblowing than you would think of generally in that it, the, the, the governments in place in the Czech Republic in the 20th century had a, a, a habit of using police networks and informants um, to keep track of what citizens were, were doing and thinking and if there were any kind of subversive or popular movement about to uh, take off then this network would, would, would be aware of it. So, it wasn't so they, there was a, uh, whistleblowers were viewed kind of as snitches then, huh? And actually as, as informants. And so there's a lot of, it's not just that you have to build a positive context around whistleblowers now, but that you also have to kind of combat a negative, uh, a, a negative context around them. And there also isn't a sense of trust of government. That is, it's not just who is the whistleblower, but who does he report to, or who does she report to. And in the... Did in the conference come up with some ideas about how to address these questions? The main idea was that there's a gap between the ethical individual employee and the authorities, whether they're public or private sector, that would receive a, a disclosure, and that into that gap we need to move the NGO community because the NGO community is trusted, especially in the Czech Republic where there has been a peaceful revolution based on citizen activism and that that, that um, you can't really call it a tradition, but that that political space is open and non-governmental organizations can, can operate fairly freely there. Dylan, one of the things that you were talking about at that January, January conference is the role of new and social media, uh, how NGOs can avail themselves of it. Apparently, people were pretty struck by what you had to say. You were invited back to Prague for a follow-up visit uh, for an International Human Rights Film Festival. Tell me about your role at that festival. Sure. Well, um, the, the role that I played was that the organizers of the International Human Rights Film Festival, which is a great you know, festival that just really showcases you know, problems around the world, was that they wanted to go ahead and match it up with a workshop for the NGO community in the Czech Republic and surrounding countries, so specifically Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, and really teach you know, these, these individuals at NGOs how to successfully use new media to enact social change. It's this interesting place where, you know, NG NGOs now in America, you know, can use Facebook and Twitter relatively successfully and, and blogging, for example. But they don't, they don't have that in the Czech Republic yet. They're just about two or three years sort of behind the curve. Very similar to what America, where the United States was, you know, about two or three years, the NGOs here, where it's, you know, we have a Facebook page and then it's, you know, trying out what can we do with it. And that's really where they're at right now. They just have a Facebook page and they kind of think it's going to take off by itself. But well, before we go any farther, what, what is it that you do as an NGO with a Facebook page that sure. advances the NGO? Well, you can, I mean, it allows for direct, you know, interaction with people who are, with your online supporters who are, you know, speaking back and forth to you, you know, online and just asking, uh, you know, what does this mean exactly with why are you guys taking this particular program track? You know, they share it with their friends. All of a sudden, your lists are improving. People are going to your website more. They want to check regular updates. They might get involved in, you know, electronic newsletters or the regular media that you're sending out. Everybody was really, really interested in that. I mean, it's in, in the Czech Republic and from the, um, the other three countries. They, 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 the younger generation there, um, as opposed to the older generation, which is what B was talking about, who grew up with this sort of, you know, culture of silence and it's sort of ingrained with them. Um, they desperately want to enact social change. They didn't grow up, you know, with the rule themselves because they were children and teenagers and they kind of rebelled against it, you know, uh, like the older generation did then. But they just want, you know, um, they believe that they can make changes in new media. It's different. So you've got this, and, and social media has always been more popular with the younger generation anyway across the board. If you go to America, if you go, you know, to any of the European countries. So it's this nice confluence that's happening. They want social change. They're getting more familiar with you know, social media. They have a drive to get familiar with social media as opposed to the older generation who just still sort of downplays it. Um, so it's a nice, it's almost a perfect storm of what's going on. They, they want to initiate this kind of government and corporate accountability, and they want to learn the tools you know, to make that happen. Now, when you say that social media isn't as advanced in the Czech Republic and Slovakia and in Poland and Hungary, 
Are you saying that Facebook, Twitter don't exist there or right. are just new, or is it that the NGOs haven't learned how to use them yet? Facebook is becoming much more popular in the Czech Republic, and so is Twitter, and so is all these sorts of, you know, just new social media tasks and programs. But now it's the, they're just beginning, the NGO community, to look at this is a valuable tool that we can utilize to, you know, spread our word, get younger people involved, um, you know, in our causes. And the, the people that I spoke with are across the board in terms of the organizations they represent. Some are, you know, pushing for um, better, better women's rights in cities. Some are pushing for environmental concerns. Some are pushing, you know, strictly for political stuff. Some are looking for corporate as well. And it's just they all, they don't have the, they don't have the knowledge yet, but they're going to get in, you know, they're going to get into it now. And the sooner they do, the sooner they can, you know, broadcast their message to everyone. Okay, so what do you project in terms of the future for communications in Central Europe? Is it going to look like uh, the U.S. or is it going to be very uh, specific to that region? It, it, it depends on how quickly it grows. I know that in, when I spoke at the, at the documentary film festival, um, someone made the comment to me that everybody who was there made up about half of the NGO community in the entire country and there are only about 200, 250 people there. So if you ask people who you know, are there, if you ask the, the younger generation right now in the Czech Republic, how strong is you know, the NGO community? Many of them will tell you it's, it's incredibly strong because from where they were, where they had absolutely nothing 10 or 15 years ago, and now they've got all these networks you know, starting to happen, um, but they realize they're not as advanced as specifically Italy, Spain, the U.S. in terms of having these NGO communities. So as long as they keep growing and the NGO community you know, takes hold and people get more involved, which it seems like the younger generation does want to do, they want to dedicate their life to these different social causes and enacting change, um, it's going to take off. It's going to grow you know, in the next like five to ten years very quickly. So we talked a little bit about, and we'll close with this, but we talked a little bit about uh, the reputation or the uh, how people view a whistleblower in the Czech Republic. What is the cultural context for whistleblowing? You described me a little bit about the, the history of people being viewed as informants and snitches, but does the concept even exist in the Czech language? Well, it was something that came up at the January meeting, and it tends to come up at at international meetings that the word whistleblower is something that originated in English and it has that that individual uh, and individualistic connotation. There is no direct translation in Czech and we learned also that there is no word for accountability in, in the Czech language. But there does seem to be uh, certainly an awareness of a need for that and uh, there is a, a great concern about problems of corruption and fraud in uh, government and in both the public and the private sector. And, and I think there, there is also a, a, a tradition of, of very committed citizen activism that um, will begin to link to the kind of technology that Dylan was talking about to really change the culture. Right. These new tools, yeah, Dylan. And I mean, it, it's interesting just to follow up on what B was saying. They don't the 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 ramifications for you know whistleblowing is negative in the Czech Republic. But what's interesting is that it, it's just because they're viewed individually as snitches or rats. The practice itself is not um, is not associate. They don't associate one whistleblower with another. There's no connection between one between a person who comes from the drug industry or the environmental industry. You know, they're just seen as as this was difficult for B and I to surmise exactly what they're seen as, but I mean, it's just this is a person who had an environmental concern, and that's it. And this is a person who had a problem with the government. But they're not equated, you, they would never equate Daniel Ellsberg and Frank Serpico as being similar whatsoever, because they're not, because they just don't have a word for whistleblower, mm -hmm. and they don't understand it as, as much as they as much as they will very soon. Okay. Well, thanks to B. Edwards and Dylan Blaylock of the Government Accountability Project for describing and making sense of your recent experiences in the Czech Republic. When we return, a leading Czech investigative reporter, but first we'll chat with a Czech citizen who dared to blow the whistle.
My name is Jeremy Drucker, and I'm the Executive Director of Transitions Online. We're here today talking to Libor Mahalik, who has become the Czech Republic's most famous whistleblower, probably of all time. And this interview is produced in cooperation with the Government Accountability Project. So, Mr. Mahalik, I would like to first ask you if you'd please explain to us a little bit about uh, your agency, or the fund, and its role here in the Czech Republic. Státní fond životního prostředí je takzvaným administrujícím subjektem pro ekologické programy. Vztah k ministerstvu životního prostředí je ten, že ministerstvo životního prostředí řídí, to znamená ve směrnicích definuje, jak budou ty jednotlivé programy probíhat a státní fond životního prostředí je právnickou osobou, která zajišťuje chod těch jednotlivých programů. Takže když uvedu příklad, jeden z hlavních programů, takzvaná Zelená úsporám, je dotačním programem, který vlastně financuje zateplování domů nebo ty dotace směřují na nákup tepelných čerpadel a podobně. Cílem tohoto programu je snížit emise CO2 a na tento program je určený nějaký objem finančních prostředků a ministerstvo životního prostředí následně určuje podle jakých pravidel budou ty dotace přidělovány a podobně. When did you actually join the fund and how long were you there before you started to notice something that you thought was wrong? Já jsem na, na fond životního prostředí nastoupil v srpnu roku 2010 a hned vlastně v následujícím týdnu jsem byl žádán tehdejším poradcem ministra životního prostředí, abych dělal nějaké kroky směřující k výměně právní kanceláře, která měla zajišťovat prodej emisních kreditů a následovaly potom další nestandardní požadavky. Takže dá se říct, že po celou dobu toho mého působení ve fondu byly kladeny nejrůznější požadavky na řekněme, netransparentním nebo na realizaci nestandardních, netransparentních praktik. Could you give us maybe one or two more examples? Tak jedním z těch příkladů je právě to vyměnit právní kancelář a realizovat výběrové řízení na novou právní kancelář takovým způsobem, aby zvítězila předem určená firma. K tomu měl sloužit prostředník, jiná, jiná poradenská firma a ta její role vlastně měla být hlavně při otvírání obálek s cenovými nabídkami a to v tom smyslu, že pokud by ta cenová nabídka té určené vítězné firmy nebyla na adekvátní úrovni, tak tento prostředník měl zajistit výměnu nabídky. Podobně, podobně mělo fungovat vybírání bank, kde ten státní fond životního prostředí měl ukládat finanční prostředky, takže opět role toho prostředníka v té podobě Zhromáždit, popta, zhromáždit nabídky od jednotlivých bank, po otevření obálek vyhodnotit, jestli ta banka, která má zvítězit, nenabídla buď příliš vysokou úrokovou sazbu, aby zbytečně prostě neplatila nad rámec ostatních bank, anebo naopak příliš nízkou, že by vyhrát nemohla. A, Tady takovýchto, řekněme, netransparentních uh, praktik uh, tam bylo uh, ve více oblastech. Mm -hmm. 
Nejdříve mně nebylo vysvětlováno to, z jakých důvodů nebo kde má končit ta případná provize nebo ten benefit. Až teprve, řekněme, po dvou měsících, kdy jsem odmítal některé kroky dělat, tak jsem měl takový další rozhovor s panem poradcem, nebo tehdejším poradcem Knetigem, a v tom rozhovoru on trošku obšírněji začal vysvětlovat, co má být významem a popsal vlastně mechanismus, kdy například při nadhodnocení zakázek anebo při uložení určitých prostředků v určité bance mělo docházet k tomu, že buď ta vítězná firma anebo ta banka by část prostředků použila na nějaké marketingové prostě nebo jiné akce v souvislosti s financováním politických aktivit. And then later on, what did you think of your options at the time? Tak já jsem neměl moc možností tady tu věc diskutovat interně dovnitř fondu, protože vlastně jsem byl v pozici ředitele fondu a ten problém nespočíval v prvé řadě v tom, že by nějaký zaměstnanec fondu chtěl dělat něco nekalého, byť tam byla jedna výjimka u prvního náměstka, ale ten hlavní problém spočíval v tom, že poradce, který vyžadoval určité aktivity, tak vlastně zůstával mimo odpovědnost tím, že nedával téměř žádné písemné pokyny a ty ústní pokyny dával v místnosti, kde byla například zapnutá rušička a nebylo možné úplně triviálně získat záznam z takového průběhu jednání. Řešil jsem samozřejmě otázku, koho na toto jednání upozornit. V prvé řadě to byl vlastně ministr vnitra, kterého jsem kontaktoval s cílem zjistit, jaké jsou nahrávací prostě zařízení pro takováto prostředí. Ten mi teda mimo jiné doporučil obrátit se na určitého novináře, který takovým zařízením disponoval, ale než jsem to udělal, tak jsem ještě se snažil kontaktovat premiéra, protože on, respektive vláda, může úkolovat tzv. bezpečnostní informační službu, to znamená orgán, který má mimo jiné za cíl chránit ekonomické zájmy státu a disponuje taky touto technikou. A teprve v okamžiku, kdy ani tohleto, ani této žádosti prostě nebylo vyhověno, tak jsem přistoupil k té cestě kontaktování novináře. Did you hesitate at all in, in, uh, in going forward? Did you have any thought in your mind that uh, this is something maybe to think a bit more about? Tak uh, určitě tam byla obava z toho, že tady tento krok může skončit mým odvoláním z funkce. Uh, což byl krok vlastně v působnosti ministra životního prostředí, pro kterého tento poradce e, pracoval. E, to, že jsem e, třeba ty nahrávky chtěl dávat buď třeba tomu novináři nebo jiným osobám, tak určitě mělo za cíl se jistit pro případ, že e, by tam byla nějaká negativní odezva. So I believe you lost your job almost immediately. What kind of other retaliation uh, did you did you experience? Tak uh, já jsem byl odvolán z té funkce ředitele, ale neskončil ten můj pracovní poměr, takže v současné době uh, tam jsem zařazen jako finanční poradce v tom státním uh, fondu. Uh, pro mě bylo poměrně překvapivé, jaký, jaký mediální zájem vlastně tady ta věc uh, vyvolala. 
A velmi náročné byly samozřejmě ty první dny po tom odvolání. Dneska s odstupem více než měsíce už je ta situace klidnější. Za pozitivní beru to, že většina těch komentátorů se vyjadřovala pozitivně na tu moji adresu, takže přestože byly tendence počernit moji osobu, označovat mě za nějakého sektáře nebo neschopného manažera a podobně, tak většina, většina těch komentátorů se k té mé osobě stavila pozitivně a, a jak podpora u zaměstnanců fondu životního prostředí, tak třeba i podpora na různých webových eh, serverech eh, je fakt vysoká, takže jsem spíš příjemně překvapen. If you could please just explain to us a little bit more about the content of the tapes that you had recorded and how they then appeared in the press, because I think for many of us it was a surprise that the Prime Minister came to the defense of the Minister of the Environment when one of the tapes, one of the recordings, clearly had him telling you to destroy the, the evidence, destroy the tapes. So if you could please explain that a little bit more. Já jsem samozřejmě tušil, že pan ministr ví o některých aktivitách pana Knetiga, takže mě by nepřekvapovalo to, že v okamžiku, kdy cítil, že tohoto poradce ztrácí, tak, tak prostě může mít nějaké tendence krýt jo, jeho osobu a podobně, ale spíš bych čekal, že si třeba pan ministr vyžádá ty nahrávky nebo kopie nahrávek, aby se sám nejdříve přesvědčil, co přesně pan Knetik řekl nebo co přesně řekli advokáti jedné z firm, která vlastně se měla účastnit vítězně určité zakázky. A pro mě vlastně to, co bylo asi nejvíce překvapivé ze strany pana ministra, že se vůbec nezajímal o ten věcný obsah těch nahrávek. Takže zřejmě musel tušit, že tam pan Knetik řekl něco, co říkat neměl a proto možná takhle zkratkovitě reagoval, aby se to co nejdříve zničilo. Zmiňoval samozřejmě takové ty dovědky, nebo s tím běžte na policii, ale z celého kontextu toho rozhovoru jednoznačně vyplývalo, že by tu věc nejraději zametl pod koberec a to třeba za cenu, že by moji osobu bral do pozice náměstka na ministerstvo životního prostředí a podobně. And then going back to the, the personal uh, reaction of people around you, did you receive support from your, from your family and your friends? Určitě rodina i přátelé mě podporují tady v tomto, takže tady tady nebyl jako žádný problém s tím. What is uh, what are your hopes for the future? What would you see as being a happy ending to to this story? Tak já jsem možná ještě měl říct na začátku, že vlastně mým hlavním úkolem na tom státním fondu, tím oficiálním úkolem, bylo změnit tento fond na takzvanou zelenou banku. To znamená udělat z toho fondu instituci, která by nejenom pasivně dávala dotace, ale také aktivně fungovala na finančním trhu v oblasti ekologických projektů. A vzhledem k tomu, že tento, tuto transformaci nebo tu vizi transformace jsem připravil zhruba 14 dní předtím, než k tomu odvolání došlo, tak a připadá mi ten projekt poměrně zajímavý, tak bych rád byl u jeho realizace. Takže z tohoto důvodu se chci účastnit výběrového řízení, které má být vypsáno na tuto uvolněnou pozici ředitele. A teprve, kdyby tohleto nějak nedopadlo dobře nebo podle mých představ, tak bych asi zvažoval nějaké další varianty. So you've been here the last couple of days at a conference about whistleblowers and 
people have been speaking about the experiences in America and in the UK. What have you learned about those types of protections in other countries compared to the situation here in the Czech Republic? Tak rozhodně jsem byl příjemně překvapen, že jsou státy, kde ta ochrana whistleblowingu má i právní charakter. To byla třeba proměnová informace. Skutečně jsem se historicky nějak cíleně nezabýval tím, co třeba je nějaký optimální postup ze strany whistleblowerů a na jaké typy třeba organizací se mohou obracet. Takže v tomto smyslu to pro mě byly přínosné informace, co by třeba pro moji osobu bylo taky asi velmi přínosné, pokud by nějaká takováto organizace pomohla v případných soudních sporech, protože nelze vyloučit, že některé osoby dotčené touto kauzou se mohou bránit i soudní cestou, takže ta právní pomoc je určitě něco, co člověk uvítal. My final question is really a short one. Would you do it again? Was it worth it? Udělal, udělal bych to určitě znovu, jen ohledně těch vlastních nahrávek. Bych možná tady s tímto začal dříve, protože ta hlavní kauza, kde hrozilo největší jaksi zneužití těch evropských dotací, byla to, byla to kauza spojená s, čist, s čističkou odpadních od Praha, tak tam vlastně jsem neměl, neměl při těch jednáních ještě žádnou techniku k dispozici a ty důkazy jsou jenom v rovině tvrzení nebo převážně v rovině tvrzení, takže tam možná by člověk byl dneska už pohotovější. OK, well thank you very much for, for telling us your story. Welcome back to Whistle Where You Work. It's called Respect. Think of it as the Time Magazine of the Czech Republic. Marek Švela is the deputy editor of Respect. He is also a Fulbright fellow working for several months at the Government Accountability Project in Washington, D.C., examining how good government groups in the U.S. coordinate efforts to maximize their impact and how this approach might translate to the Czech context. Welcome, Mark, to Whistle Where You Work. Hi. Thank you to be here. Um, we were just hearing an interview with uh, Libor Mikalik, uh, who um, is widely seen as the most important whistleblower in the short history of the Czech Republic. Uh, how is he viewed by the Czech public? Uh, I'm not sure if, if, uh, if uh, there has been any opinion pool about it. I, I made some research and I didn't find anything. But I think his case was very important uh, uh, to see or to get to know how, how the corruption in a politic deep rooted is. And, and uh, for me it was very shock uh, to see how quickly uh, this new anti-corruption government uh, has uh, started to create a new uh, corruption canals. There was just uh, a controversy about about his uh, secret recordings. Uh, uh, people uh, had uh, uh, different opinions. Uh, if if is it uh, fair to to record someone he doesn't uh, know about it? So, what, just so everybody is clear, Mr. McCulloch recorded a conversation with the environment minister without the minister's knowledge that it was being recorded. Yeah, yes, right. And the effect was that the environment minister acknowledged committing all sorts of uh, corruption, uh, but the Czech public isn't so sure that it was uh, fair for Mr. McCulloch to record that conversation without the environment minister's knowledge. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and this this kind of feeling has uh, some kind of connection with uh, 
past, you know, when uh, secret po uh, police made such recordings, you know, a lot. Uh, so I think uh, news media should uh, promote uh, better knowledge about uh, public in uh, uh, terrorist in such case, which was you know obvious. Mm -hmm. And so tell me what you think about that. Uh, the idea of recording somebody without their knowledge, uh, but going into that, recognizing that you were trying to extract from them essentially a confession. In the Mr. Mikali case, it was it was huge public pu public in uh, earth terrace. That we got very important information uh, from him. So, so I think I think it was it was okay. So he he used such uh, a, a tools uh, to get uh, his information. And so, uh, in other words, what you're saying is that it is the significance of the information. Uh, will determine whether the method of it gaining it yeah, okay. is, is appropriate. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. So he's um, being, his revelations, his disclosures are being um, received pretty well generally by the public. The only concern is how he went about learning uh, of the environment minister's wrongdoing. Would you say that that would be the public? perspective about a whistleblower in neighboring countries as well to the extent that you know like Hungary and Poland and Slovakia? Yes I know I think so. Uh, I guess so. Uh, it will be very uh, similar like in the Czech Republic uh, uh, that pe pe people are uh, getting uh, to, to know right now what's uh, going on. So what does it mean when we talk about whistleblowers and uh, and about law uh, protection of whistleblowers. So we heard in an earlier segment um, that uh, whistleblowing as a concept doesn't really exist in the language, in the Czech language, uh, and based upon the history of police states and, and surveillance by the government that people who uh, um, talk about others um, are considered snitches and, and uh, rather than uh, s seeing people who speak out for the public good as doing a public service necessarily all the time. So uh, why would it matter from your perspective that there be a change, a cultural change in the Czech Republic as to the attitude about whistleblowing? Yeah, you know, I'm uh, I'm optimistic, and it uh, I think that's question of uh, uh, a generation change. Uh, you know, young pe people didn't you know live in a police state before the the 1989. Uh, so what I see there is a difference uh, between whistleblowers uh, from the uh, politics and whistleblowers from the corporate world uh, because. Uh, People are really fed up about politics, and so it's quite easy to bring and offer some information, some or to blow a whistle. Uh, what about the role of the old media, magazines like Respect, uh, in terms of changing the culture? Uh, yeah, I think I think media are uh, doing or have been uh, doing a good, good job uh, in the newspaper paper you can read every week actually about some uh, case of corruption or, or something like that. All right. Well, many thanks to you, Mark Shvela, and best of luck to Respect Magazine in your efforts to bring greater openness and accountability to the Czech Republic. The Government Accountability Project is speaking with Open Society Fund Prague about cooperating to advance whistleblower concerns in the Czech Republic. I'm Mark Cohen. Please join us again next time on Whistle Where You Work. Mm -hmm.